Matthew chapter 5. So you are all aware that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is often called the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the greatest and the most famous sermon preached by the Lord Jesus Christ, known even by non-believers. A non-believer, when he read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7, he said, there is enough food for the whole world. But unfortunately, the same non-believer said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians, because your Christians are so unlike Christ. Maybe this is an exaggeration, but we know that the Sermon on the Mount has touched the life of so many people, and it's didactic, it's teaching, it's theological, it's a masterpiece. And Jesus directly said it and taught his own disciples. So the teaching Jesus gave was strictly and directly to his disciples. But through them, he was teaching the crowd. I wouldn't dare to give as a, an overview of the Sermon on the Mount because there is much to come. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you find the name of God 20 times. There are 50 imperatives, commands. But there are 300 descriptive verbs. This is just to show that the Sermon on the Mount is not just do's and don'ts. There are facts. There are descriptions about Christian attitudes in our Christian life. We don't do what is happening in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 to be saved, but because we are saved, this is the way we behave. That's the difference. So Jesus taught his disciples, and as a proof of his authority, we are told he sat down. That was a proof of his authority in the past. While the students stood, the teachers will sit. So I want to draw your attention on just a well-known verse, just one verse. But there is so much food, spiritual food, hopefully for our instruction this morning. Matthew 5, verse 13. Very well-known verse, very classic. And we do not dare go beyond. Normally, the two verses, 13 and 14, the salt and the light, are taken together. But I want just to draw your attention on your attention on verse 13. Matthew 5, verse 13. Jesus speaking. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its faith savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. So, ye are the salt of the earth. Salt in the past was a sign of wealth, and hopefully of health also. Salt was so precious that it was called the white gold. Cotton has replaced it now, but in the past, salt was a precious commodity. And Roman soldiers, laborers, workers, in the past were paid with salt, because salt was a substitute for money. Actually, the word salary, so when you get your salary, it's really to buy salt. But you can buy tons of salt to put your salary to pay. But in the past, that was the meaning. So people were paid in order to buy salt. But salt was also a trading. There was a lot of trading happening. 
And still nowadays in landlocked nations, there are camel caravans bringing back the rock salt because salt is a common necessity, it is a daily necessity. The salt is unique, it is precious, but it is also a, an essential for life. So when we read the, the New Testament, there are many descriptions, many names. Christians are called by many names in the New Testament. They are called saints, they are called disciples, they are called athletes, they are called soldiers, they are called laborers, they are called branches, we are also called sheep. But here, in an, an amazing way, the Lord Jesus Christ says to his disciples, he are the soul of the earth. And this is what I would like to explain in the lapse of time we have before us this morning. And the first thing I would like you to notice, he said, ye are. And that second plural pronoun, the second person plural pronoun, is very emphatic. You and only you. Oh, others may pretend, but you alone are the soul of the earth. This is interesting. He doesn't say to them, as we hear in the world today, wow, you are the heroes, you are the champions, you are the rubies, you are the philanthropists, you are the moralists, you are the humanists, and so on. But ye are the soul. Not the vinegar, not the sugar, not the honey, not even the soft and melty butter, but ye are the soft. So why, why does Jesus choose that particular attribute? And he says, ye are the salt of the earth. And I'm sure you have noticed that. He doesn't say you will be, you should be, or try to be, or you can be. But it's the present continuous tense. You are now and always be. So, soul is very important. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ has chose that attribute. But I'm, I'm just trying to build for, before we enter in the verse, because the verse comes also in a specific context. If you read uh, Matthew 5, you know that there are the Beatitudes, eight or nine Beatitudes happening, the great blessing of the people who belong to the kingdom of God. But the immediate context before Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, is in the context of persecution. Never forget that. It's in the context of persecution. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the son of the earth. That's the context. So which means the world will threaten Christians. The world will be against Christians. But Christians must have an impact and influence on the world. And remember, salt kept in the salt shaker will never do anything. But we will explain more of that because the Lord Jesus Christ has chosen a very specific attribute to say, you are the salt of the earth. So that's the context. So the Lord uh, gave also this teaching on salt, or about salt, three times, which tells me Oh, that's very important. This is why I want to dwell on this verse. Three times in Matthew, in Mark chapter 9, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus gave the teaching on Saul. You will not find exactly the same words. He gave it on three different occasions using different words, but the principle is always the same. You are the salt of the earth. So, salt influences everything it comes in contact with. And there are hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating here, there are hundreds of you 
use this merit of salt. But believe me, before we go any further, we are not talking about cuisine. We are not talking about cooking. We are not talking about chemistry. We are not talking about chemicals. We are talking about an application, about a teaching, the teaching the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his disciples, and how we can apply that to our own self today, this morning. And I have selected a few examples of the use of salt, just a few of them as a reminder. And this is universal. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. It is not a command, it is a fact. So the first thing about the use of, of salt, and as I said, it is universal, all salt is for savoring and flavoring. Salt is a flavoring and seasoning condiment. And it enhances or changes the taste of something. And in the past, in ancient times, an unsalty meal or a too much salty meal would bring troubles in the family. It was a shame. But even nowadays, and I'm sure people who are used to, to, to do the cooking and so on will agree with that. When you make a meal, you present the meal to somebody, and the first thing before even he tastes it is to, to pour salt on it. But this, is, this is terrible. What are you doing? But even when we diplomatically, gently, nicely, with all kind words, ask for salt after the meal has been served to us, we tasted it, there is the indirect communication we are making which is exasperating many people. Why? Because by asking salt, we are telling something is missing. But in Job chapter 6, verse 6, we don't need to turn to that. Job chapter 6, verse 6, and we find God's recipe on how to eat an egg. I'm sure by curiosity we will try to go there. But we find God's recipe on how to eat an egg. Before science didn't invent that. The chef didn't invent that. It was there. And we believe that Job was actually the first book, the oldest book of the Bible. So before time, before technology, before great cuisine, the Lord gave his recipe and to show that salt is so important. Why? Because salt sharpens and stimulates our appetite. Oh, we can say more that. But the second attribute or the second use of salt, salt is also used it has an ability to preserve. It has an ability to protect. So salt preserves. And in the past, remember most of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. And in the past, meat and salt, they didn't have fridges, they didn't have freezers. You take things for granted. But remember, when Jesus said to them, you are the salt of the earth, it was said in a particular context. So meat and salt, uh, meat and uh, fish were wrapped in the salt to prevent decay. And actually, to prevent and to protect is the number one quality and uh, property of salt in the Bible. So to preserve and to protect is the quality number one of salt in the Bible. Why I'm stressing and emphasizing on this? Because we live in a world, oh, believe me, you don't need me to tell you, it's a corrupted world. And First John chapter 2, verse 17 says, we are in a world that is passing away, that is passing by. You may dwell in it, but remember the pilgrim concept. We are just here, here today and come tomorrow. But we live in a, in a petrified world, in a corrupted world, in a perverse world. 
So the salt, when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, or one of the quality of the presence of Christians in this world is to preserve and protect this world. I hope this doesn't uh, 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 lift up your, 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 your pride by saying, just imagine this world without Christians. Just imagine this world without the effect and impact of Christianity. The world believes in it or not, the world accepts it or not, the influence of Christianity is just awesome. The laws, the literature, the, the modernity, every domain, every department you take, even in Muslim worlds, even in Muslim nations, even in atheist nations, no matter what nation you take in this world, every department, you will find a stump of Christianity in it. They may deny it, they may spell it, but we cannot deny the reality of it. There are countries where Christianity is not there at all, but you find even streets named after a Christian who was there in the past. Ye are the son of the But it's interesting, uh, the, third, the third quality, salt is also a fertilizer, which means that the soil becomes more ready to receive the seed, and salt makes things to grow. And I, I hate to put myself in a, in, in a circle, but just to give you an illustration, we didn't have much trees back home, but we had two fruit tree trees in the courtyard, a guava tree and a lemon tree. For so many years, I have seen this uh, lemon tree for 15 years in the courtyard, it has never given us uh, any fruit. And I said to myself, we should do as the Lord Jesus Christ, in the parable the Lord Jesus Christ gave about the tree which is there, occupying just the place and not giving any fruit. So what should we do? We should cut it. But somebody came and uh, I don't know what kind of te technology he used. I mean, I, I saw it because it, it, it gave fruits later. He took rock salt. This is the kind of salt we have there. He took rock salt, not uh, sea salt. And he made a triangle around the lemon tree, three, three uh, holes. And he filled the three, three, the, 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 the three holes with salt. And believe the next years we were able to have benefits. But the other side of the coin is also true. Why? Because in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 9, if you want your enemy to starve, you know what you should do? Sow salt in his field. You wouldn't harvest at the next harvest. The fourth one, the fourth quality or property of salt, is that salt, or you don't need me to tell you this again, you are more familiar with it than me. Salt clears and melts what? Snow. So salt is stronger than ice. Which means again when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, the gospel of redeeming grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel we have, the gospel we preach, the irresistible grace we preach is stronger than the hardened, the most hardened heart in the world. Salt is stronger than ice. The gospel is stronger than the heart of man. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. The fifth uh, uh, property of salt is that salt is an anesthetic, it is an antiseptic. So which means salt heals. When it comes in contact with a wound, oh yes, it hurts, but it heals. And in the book of Ezekiel, again, we don't have time to turn into the verses, but Ezekiel chapter 16, we are told that in, that, in, their, in their time, in that time as a custom, when a child is born, they wash the body of the child and rub the body of the child with salt. 
And the text says in verse 4, as an act of compassion. And even we are told that sometimes they will mix the salt with honey and olive oil. Then they will wrap the child in order to protect the child and it cleans, it washes away the, the birth the birth residues, but also uh, it uh, protected the child against rashes. If you if I may say it was their baby powder. That's the way that's the way they, they used it in that time. I don't know which company, but this is how they used it in order to protect the child. So you can see also the other side of the same coin, not to distract you. The other side of the coin, if salt heals, oh, every doctor will tell you that. Salt can also heal. So we know that too much of anything is, uh, is bad. Oh, the prayer, the prayer we should have. Lord, help me to be the salt, to know how much to give, to know when to stop, and to know what to say. So when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, you can combine all those properties into that attribute, into the quality he is putting on believers, on his disciples. But there is one exception where salt will never kill. If you raise up the blood pressure of sinners to request and ask about the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> that's the greatest one speaking about the gospel to sinners. But the sixth one will even uh, uh, drive home what I'm trying to say. Because a sixth quality about salt is that salt promotes and creates thirst. If only again we can we could, uh, we could incite men and women to be more thirsty about the Lord Jesus Christ, to be more thirsty for the gospel. And not long, not long away, or not far away from our text here, we see what the Lord Jesus Christ said about blessed are they which uh, hunger, uh, uh, which uh, do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So that's the when Jesus said, "You are the salt of the earth." Uh, that by representing the Lord Jesus Christ, by being his, uh, his ambassadors before sinners, that sinners also will hunger and thirst after righteousness. But there is a seventh one. I think the seventh one is a glorious one. Salt symbolizes covenant. Again, no time to go into the verses, Leviticus chapter 2, Numbers 18, Second Chronicles chapter 13, Ezekiel 43. In all those verses or chapters, you find that the covenant, sacrifices and offerings were made and mixed with salt. Why? That makes them to last. Oh, what am I trying to say here? A Christian, an authentic Christian, a true Christian will never lose his salvation. Why? Because there is a binding covenant which will last forever with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we often preach it, we say, if you choose him, you lose him. But if the Lord Jesus Christ has chosen you, he has the power to keep you and to present you, Jude, verse 24, and to present you faultless before God on that day. So, covenant, there is a covenant. When Jesus said, you are the salt, he gives also that symbolism of binding covenant. So, as salt, we are Christ's ambassadors for an everlasting and eternal covenant. We are his representatives in this world. The eighth picture is found in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Salt is also a, a, a picture of wisdom. Actually, the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, were using salt to speak about wisdom. And this is why Paul said in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, he said, 
walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. So when he said, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, I hope nobody is trying to put salt on words. That's not the meaning. And as Calvin said, we must sprinkle the grace of God over people. That's the meaning. The grace of God. And brothers and sisters, we believe in the doctrines of grace. But sadly, and I, I, I have to, to put it this way, sadly, many people put the, the emphasis on what? Doctrine. Doctrine. And they forget the word grace. Oh, how gracious we must be. How gracious we must be with one another. How gracious we must be towards sinners. We believe in the doctrines of grace, but we speak about them with wisdom. As Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Pray daily for wisdom. The ninth one, I hope you, you don't mind. It's not the number which is important. I could have given 20. But it's each one pictures something the Lord Jesus Christ has called us to do. And the ninth one, according to Mark 9, verse 50, salt symbolizes peace. Because in that text, the Lord Jesus Christ is linking and connecting salt with peace. And again, without going far, in the text here, Matthew 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You see, Christians are automatically, the lion becomes a lamb. <laughs> That's the change, the transformation which happens in our life. That we don't, we don't need to be in a non-violent movement or in, a, in an ecologic movement or po political party. Because by being converted, by walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, automatically he, he gives us that capacity, he gives us that possibility, then we become the salt of the earth, which means here we become peacemakers. Christians don't need to claim that they are pacifists, but we are peacemakers. That's the quality. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the peace, the Prince of Peace. And we derive that quality from Him. But there is a tenth one here, which is also important. Salt makes no noise. <laughs> it acts in silence. And why am I mentioning this? this? This speaks about so many churches. And I believe in any church where you have noise, there are two things. The first one, there is noise because of vanity. The second, there is noise because of immaturity. So, and many preachers in those churches hide their ignorance with what? With noise. But salt acts without noise. And when it comes into contact with, the, with food or with something, it disappears. Salt is invisible when it is spread into a meal. And that's why I have never met somebody after eating a good meal who says, oh, what a good salt we had. That will be ridiculous. But salt makes no noise. It acts invisibly. It's act, it acts silently. And this is why Christians do not need to blow the trumpet to say, here we are, look what we are doing, we can change the world, we need to have an influence on the world, we want to make the world better. The world will never be better because the Bible says the world will go worse to worse. That's not our purpose, to change the politicians, to change the ecology. The ecology, the four seasons will remain, no matter what the ecological part, or I, I, I know nothing about these things, but by what God promised that until the end of this world, there will always be four seasons. Because he made the seasons, he will keep them also, until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The eleventh one, 
Salt is a mixture of sodium and chloride. And there is a particularity of, of, of on those two things, sodium and chloride, they, they, are, they are authentic, they are different, and they are inimitable. You can imitate sugar, but you cannot imitate salt. Inimitable. What? Christian life, salt, Christian life is oh, trademark. We have a trademark. What is the trademark of Christian? Difference. We are different. Oh, we are not strange people. Believe me, believe me, my brothers and sisters, if people see you as a strange person, as an awkward person, be careful. This is, this is not the way you dress the whole. Oh, this is how Christians behave. There is a problem. But we are different in our thinking, in our words, in our works, in the way we do things. We do not import the things of the world. Never. Why? Because we are different. So, salt is something different, and we must keep that difference in the world. The 12th one, I, I, I have selected 20 of them, so we are halfway. The, the 12th one, salt, just a zest is enough. Uh, again, I know nothing about cooking. I, I know how to eat, but nothing about cooking. But I have never found a recipe, a recipe where it, it tells you, you need to put five cups of salt. Just a small bit, a little bit of salt makes the work, makes the job. And here, there is an application. God doesn't need a great number. It's in First Samuel, chapter 14, verse 6. And there it says, there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by a few. So we don't look at the numbers. You know, many churches, they are, they are after spectacle. They, they want to become spectacular. They want to become sensational. They want to become successful. But we don't need to be spectacular. We don't need to be sensational. We don't need to be successful. We need to be faithful. That's the quality of salt. Salt will always achieve what it is made for. Faithful Christian must be faithful. That's our calling. And the 13th one, the 13th one, oh, salt purifies. Salt purifies. And Elijah in 2 Kings took salt, threw it in water, and the water became pure. But we know purest waters have been filtered through rocks and minerals, including salt. So salt is a flavoring, a seasoning, it preserves, it is a fertilizer, it melts and clears snow, it is an antiseptic, it is an anesthetic, it creates thirst, it symbolizes a binding covenant, it is a picture of wisdom. It is a, a symbol of peacemaking, peacemaker. We are peacemakers. Our saltiness shapes our usefulness, our peacefulness and godliness. But salt makes no noise. It does its work in silence. Salt is a mixture of sodium and chloride. It is distinctive, authentic, and inimitable. Salt, just a zest, is enough. But salt is also a purifier. Now, before I come to conclusion, it's very important to see that the depravity of man and the corruption of this world have never been so visible. So when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he knew, he knew exactly what, what he meant. What was unheard? And I'm sure most of, of, of you here will agree with that. What was unheard just a few years ago, nowadays, is of no shame again. Perversion, nowadays, is called what? An expression of liberty. Oh, it's not liberty, it's slavery. Things which will never be put forth in public now are in public. Why? Because 
of corruption, the good of the depravity of man's heart. The heart of man is wicked. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So if you think this world will, will be better, you should read that text again. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, verse 12. This world will never, will never go better. It will go worse. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. But I make a relation. It's like when Jesus said in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. And Paul says in Ephesians 5, 8, you are the children of light. So in the same way, Christ actually is the salt, the only salt. We derive our taste, our saltiness from him, because in John 15, verse 15, verse 5, he said, without me, you, do, you can do nothing. So we derive our taste. Don't think you are a freelance or, or uh, uh, something just on your own. You derive your taste from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. Christian life is not to shut oneself into an evangelical ghetto or in a religious monastery. That will never work. We need to rub shoulders with sinners every day, not to close ourselves in an office. Salt needs to be in contact with something to be effective. We don't need, again, to, to withdraw from people or to separate ourselves from their sins. But we must, gospel is for people. Gospel is to preach to people. Evangelism is people. Without people, there is no evangelism. Now, as I close, there is the last part of the text, Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, where which shall it be saved? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Uh, remember that this is happening 2,000 years ago, and the salt they had that time is very different than our Christian, crystal, and pure salt we have nowadays. And uh, there are many discussions. Can salt lose its, its taste or not? And my, my purpose is not really to answer that, because the Lord Jesus Christ himself didn't answer it. He gave the negative side. It is unthinkable for salt to lose its flavor only for one condition. Salt will lose its flavor when it is mixed with uh, impurities and toxins. If we can make the same relation from, from the impurities and toxins uh, uh, depriving salt from its beauty to the Christian life. So a Christian can also lose its saltiness, a Christian can lose his testimony and his instrumentality by entering into five things. I will list them five things. The first one, a Christian will lose its saltiness when impurities, sin, infiltrates his life. So, which means that uh, with sin, sin will pollute his life and he becomes unfruitful and loses his usefulness. And actually, the Greek word used there uh, in verse 13, but if the salt have lost its savor, that word lost his savor, it's the word which gave us, I, I had to check that, the word moral in, in English, moral. He lost his mind. Can salt lost his, its mind? Can, lost, can salt lost its flavor? Chloride is a stable substance. Salt, not being salt anymore, is of no use at all. So the Christian also, who, whose life is infiltrated by sin, will lose his, uh, his uh, instrumentality and will lose his, the purpose for which he has been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing which will make us to lose our flavor is the fear of men. 
And again, this is a whole study, we can go through it. But the fear of man, to please man, being a yes man, and yes, 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 I agree with you. Yes, we have the same God. Everyone will be saved. No, the fear of man, man is a snare, according to the Bible. The third one, we lose our instrument, instrumentality and taste when we fall into worldliness. Be transformed, not conformed. And believe me, the world, uh, this is my, my illustration, the world is like chewing gum. In the beginning it tastes nice, but later it's bitter. And this is how the world attracts so many people. It never keeps its promises. The fourth, the fourth element which will hinder our instrumentality is that disobedience will grieve the Holy Spirit and quench the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And the fifth one, prayerlessness. A Christian who doesn't pray will lose his taste, taste and he will not have any usefulness before men. But here are two applications as I close. The first one, we must preach the pure and sound gospel. We are gospel believers. And this is why the gospel preserves the world against corruption. But the gospel preserves also saints against a corrupted world. And we do not dilute it. We do not uh, sell it. We do not share it. We do not debate it. In Acts 17, Paul said, Him we declare. We declare it. So the gospel removed from its saving power serves for nothing. Second application keep yourself away from sin. Keep yourself away from worldliness. Keep yourself away from impurities. Keep yourself away from anything which will, uh, will hinder that instrumentality. Flavor matters. Keep the standards. We are God seasoning and flavoring for this world. And we may be the only Bible people may read. In your work, at home, in the street, and I come from a country where no one, most people will never read the Bible. First of all, they don't believe. And second, some of them cannot even read. They have never been to school. But you see, you are an open Bible for many people. They may never take the Bible to read, but when they see your life, oh, this is, I desire. Create and promote that thirst that people may desire the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord help us never to lose our instrumentality and never to lose our godly tastes. And if there is anyone here who is not a believer, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, Peter says, Come and taste that the Lord is good. And every believer, I'm sure, here can say, yes, indeed, the Lord is. <coughs> Let's close our thinking this morning by singing hymn number 474. Hymn number 474. In full and glad surrender, I give myself to thee.